So this evening, Harvard Bookstore is pleased to welcome Seth Mnookin. He's here to discuss his latest book, The Panic Virus, a true story of medicine, science, and fear. The Panic Virus delves into the controversial claims that we've all heard about, the connections between developmental disorders and vaccines. Mr. Mnookin examines the roots of the autism vaccine media frenzy, as well as its long-running impact. The book goes further to examine how our general response to media sensationalism and fear create an even larger concern about the way the public learns about and responds to important issues. Michael Shermer of the Wall Street Journal says the book, quote, should be required reading at every medical school in the world. The panic virus is a lesson on how fear hijacks reason and emotion trumps logic. Seth Mnookin is a contributing editor at Vanity Fair, where he's written about topics ranging from Stephen Colbert to the American media presence in Iraq. He previously has worked as a senior writer at Newsweek, and his journal journalism excuse me, has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Boston Globe, Slate, Salon.com, and other places. He's the author of two previous books, and this being the Boston Cambridge area. I'm sure everyone is familiar with his New York Times bestseller bu bestselling book, Feeding the Monster, How Many Smarts and Nerve Took a Team to the Top, based on the Red Sox. His first book, Hard News, The Scandals of the New York Times and Their Meaning for American Media, was a Washington Post book of the, uh, best book of the year. Mr. Mnookin graduated from Harvard College and was a Shorenstein Fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And most impressively, Mr. Mnookin once worked as a bookseller right here at Harvard Bookstore. We're very, very pleased to be welcoming him home tonight. Everyone, with thanks for your patience, please join me in welcoming Seth Mnookin. Um, thank you all for coming here. Uh, this probably isn't, oh, it is on, okay. Um, I think probably everyone can hear me anyway. Um, what I'm going to do is talk briefly and then leave as much time as I can for questions because um, in the interviews and uh, the talks I've done so far, I've found that I've not been able to predict at all where people's interest will lie. Um, so instead of prattling on about some part of this book that you're not interested in, I'll let you dictate how that works. Um, I assume many of you have seen over the past couple of weeks, there was a report about uh, the, the way it was represented a lot was that the 1998 study um, that first posited a claim between vaccines, between the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, and autism had been discredited. Um, that was uh, the way that the reports were framed. Um, that was great news for me for the timing of the book. Um, I had a lot of problems with the way the story was presented, and it actually dovetails a lot with the book as a whole. Um, my problem was the, the paper, that 1998 paper that appeared in The Lancet um, by a, a researcher named Andrew Wakefield had actually been discredited uh, many times, many years before. He had already lost his medical license um, the year previously. The Lancet had officially retracted the paper. Uh, his co-authors had, had also disavowed it. So for the story to then be um, uh, New, new study comes out that shows that this was disproven, I think, hi, um, my high school housemaster. Um, now I'm especially nervous. Uh, um, so uh, um, for, for that to be the way that, that, those, that, that latest, this latest round of news was presented, I think is part of the reason why this myth has persisted for so long. Um, because the media has fallen into a trap of every time a story like this comes up, and I'm not just talking about this story, um, it, it, you, it's framed in an on the one hand, on the other hand uh, paradigm, regardless of whether there's only one hand. Um, and I think uh, in this story that is done a real disservice to everyone. Um, for reasons I'll get into. Um, but I think that in terms of how we consume information, uh, it's not very healthy either. An example I talk about in the book is the birther movement. Um, this being Cambridge, I'm sure it's filled with birthers. Um, but the birther movement is a, 
came up a couple of years ago. It's it's um, led by people who don't believe Barack Obama is a legitimate president because they are convinced he wasn't born in the United States. Um, that, to my mind, is not a uh, valid topic of discussion. Uh, he was born in the United States. We shouldn't be spending our time discussing it on TV or writing about it. Um, today, the, there was an article I read in which uh, Eric Cantor, the House Majority Leader now said, um, I believe that President Obama was born in the United States, which is a little bit like my saying, I believe that Eric Cantor is the House Majority Leader. Um, he is the House Majority Leader, and, and framing it in that way, it, it presents a level of doubt that isn't there. Uh, so I think that framework, well, and, and to back up with the birther movement. So the justification that we heard a lot when, when that was on CNN and when Lou Dobbs was talking about it every night was the media was not in a role to decide one way or another what, who, who was right in that situation. Um, and, and I think that is frankly uh, both ridiculous and irresponsible. Um, the media is not in a position to decide who would be a better president. Uh, the media is not in a position to decide which side on the d abortion debate is right or wrong. Um, the media is in a position to decide things that are factually true and to present those accurately. It can also say that there are people who believe things one way or another, but I think that um, it, a lot of people end up not being served well um, when you get things presented as, as, as if they were not decided. Uh, so anyway, to go back to this, to, to go to the history of this specific story a little bit, um, that initial study, the, the Wakefield study, positing a connection between the MMR vaccine and autism, uh, came out in 1998. It was based on 12 families uh, who Andrew Wakefield said, um, well, actually, the, the paper initially said that there was a theoretical link between the vaccine and gut disorders and gut disorders and autism. Um, it made clear that it was a very speculative link. Uh, and in fact, The Lancet was so sure that it was speculative that they commissioned um, a commentary that essentially eviscerated the uh, study, which is, as one of the authors of the commentary said, um, unusual. Usually when you commission in a, in a scientific journal, if you commission a commentary, um, it's to talk about how great the study is, not to say this thing that appears two pages before this uh, has no validity. So um, that should have been a, a tip off right away. What happened then is um, Andrew Wakefield at a press conference for announcing this story said that he advised parents not to take the, not to give the MMR vaccine to their children because he was worried it was not safe. I think that the story in the next day's papers should have been um, a researcher irresponsibly tells parents to put their children at risk with no basis in fact. Uh, Instead, what the story was, um, was prominent researcher says MMR vaccine is dangerous and then had an obligatory quote from someone in the public health sector uh, who said, no, actually, we have an enormous amount of data indicating that it's safe. Um, the result was both predictable and tragic. Uh, the UK, unlike the US, does not have mandatory vaccination laws. And from uh, in the years after Wakefield's press conference and his subsequent campaign, uh, the MMR vaccine uptake rate went from over 90% to under 80%, um, and people started dying uh, for the first time in decades. People died of measles in the UK. The fact that in the 21st century, people are dying of measles in industrialized nations, I think, is both shocking and disgraceful. Um, so. Uh, the, the, the other sort of part of the vaccine scare that I talk about um, was it, it has to do with mercury, uh, a mercury-based preservative called thimerosal, um, which uh, the, the notion of, of mercury being in vaccines and, and they're being responsible for, for causing developmental disorders is uh, another thing which I think you hear about a lot. Um, this, uh, that specific sort of myth um, came about in the late 90s when uh, 
the CDC and the public health community realized that they had not tallied up the total amount of a mercury-based preservative um, uh, to see if the total amount that children could receive, uh, what, the, what that amount was and whether or not it was safe. Um, my personal opinion is that the fact that that had not been done uh, is also disgraceful, um, both on the part of vaccine manufacturers and on the part of the public health community. Um, thankfully, in the years since then, there have been many studies on literally millions of children um, indicating that the amount of thimerosal that had been in vaccines uh, was not, did not present a risk. Um, it's also important to note that thimerosal has been gone from childhood vaccines now for a decade. Um, so I, I'm constantly amazed when I hear and read and see uh, discussions of how mercury is causing autism, mercury in vaccines, because A, mercury is not in vaccines, um, and B, if you wanted to go along with the theory that mercury had been causing autism, mercury in vaccines, then you would have expected a precipitous drop after it was being removed, um, after it had been removed, which there has obviously not been. Uh, so those are the sort of two panics um, that I think, hey, uh, that my neighbor growing up, um, this is sort of a like, what was that show? Um, like, this is your life? Or, yeah. I um, uh, um, expect my prom date at any moment. Um, uh, so um, I started working on this story um, in, uh, in 2008. Um, and at the time, a lot of my children were, a lot of my friends were having children. Um, uh, and so I started to hear, I assume like a lot of people, about um, this concern, this fear that vaccine caused autism, vaccines. Um, at the time, that was the result largely of uh, uh, Jenny McCarthy's media appearances um, related to uh, a number of books she wrote about her belief that, um, that, that vaccines had resulted in her son's autism, which she says that she has subsequently cured. Um, uh, and, but she was speaking about this a lot and getting an enormous amount of airtime, oftentimes without any other views being presented. Um, she was on Oprah, she was on Larry King, um, uh, she was on the morning shows, she was on Greta Van Susteren's shows, and in most of those, when opposing viewpoints were presented, uh, it was in the form of reading a rote statement by the CDC. Um, so you had a photogenic uh, parent talking about her struggle to protect her child, um, and then a literally faceless bureaucracy um, speaking in, in bureaucratic language. Uh, it's not hard to predict which side would have seemed more um, appealing or, or, or uh, had more of a sort of draw. So when I started working on this, what interested me was that all uh, my friends um, who were having kids uh, seemingly had not, di didn't know which of these two sides was right, um, whether vaccines were safe, uh, which was what pediatricians and, and the public health community was saying, or whether they were not safe, which was what um, uh, an increasingly vocal group of parents was saying. Um, and that fascinated me, that this I assumed to be an issue about which it, there, was a, um, there was factual information one way or another. So, and and I, I contrast it to another emotional issue, um, which is abortion. Uh, you can have very legitimate disagreements, differences of opinion over the ethical and moral implications of abortion. Um, uh, I think those are valid discussions and valid arguments to have. Um, this was not a discussion about the ethical or legal or moral implications of something. It was a discussion about the scientific basis of something. Um, and what a lot of my friends were saying was, 
this was an issue that they were deciding on instinct. Um, they were going with their gut. And uh, their guts told a lot of them that vaccines might not be safe. Um, so I started working on the book at, for, uh, based on those conversations. Um, and I had no idea at the time what was true. It seems and seemed and seems very plausible to me that drug companies um, did not have our best interests at heart. Uh, it seems very plausible to me that the government, A, can't always be trusted, and B, isn't always competent. Um, so I was very willing to uh, consider the, the, the notion that, um, that vaccines were dangerous, that there had been some screw up somewhere along the line. Um, I, I then spent several years um, reading uh, scientific studies and papers and have been mocked many times for the length of the bibliography in here, to which um, I answer, this is the selected bibliography. And you should have seen what it was before my publisher said, you can't run a 200-page bibliography. Um, but, and, and, uh, and, and I read um, court cases and uh, I, I, I did hundreds of hours of interviews um, and I, as you can probably tell from my remarks before this, was left with the very, very strong conclusion um, that there is not a connection between vaccines and developmental disorders, uh, and um, that we were uh, unquestionably starting to see the effects of, of that myth. Um, ten children died last year in California of whooping cough. Ten children in one state alone died of whooping cough. Nine of them were under six months old. I, that, again, um, I think is uh, shocking and represents a failure on our part as a society, um, that children are dying of vaccine-preventable diseases. Uh, so um, one last thing, I, 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 well, actually, two last things I want to say. Um, one is uh, another similarity with this and, and the abortion debate, which I think um, is one of the most difficult parts of this, is that the two sides who feel most strongly about this don't really speak. Um, in fact, there's an enormous amount of uh, anger and, and distrust. Um, parents who believe that vaccines have injured their children um, think that people who uh, are proponents of vaccination are essentially um, killing and sacrificing children. Um, people who, uh, pediatricians and some people in the public health community who were very in favor of vaccines and, and say rightly so that it's um, uh, one, of the, one of the most significant public health uh, 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 steps ever, um, think that people who are arguing against vaccination are contributing to the rise of, of these diseases. Um, since I started this not being in one camp or the other, I think I was given, um, I had a somewhat unique opportunity to spend a lot of time with people. Um, and uh, I can say without any shred of doubt that parents who believe that their children were harmed are speaking from a hundred percent genuine and honest place. Um, they want nothing more to protect their children. Uh, it's very understandable to me why if um, your child is diagnosed with a developmental disorder in the same period of time in which they're getting vaccines, and it's almost always the same period of time because you're vaccinated when you're under three and you're usually diagnosed with developmental disorders when you're that age. Um, it's very easy for me to understand why people draw that connection, especially when there is now a community of people like Andrew Wakefield, um, of people selling uh, $80,000 hyperbaric oxygen chambers, um, uh, people selling special diets um, and therapies, uh, all telling these families, um, we're the only ones who support you and care about you. 
the everyone else has turned their backs on you. Um, and so if you stick with us and listen to us, we will cure your child. Uh, if you listen to what the you know doctors and government officials are saying, um, your child will never get better. Uh, I would like to think that if something, if, if my child was diagnosed with a developmental disorder, that I would not react um, in the way that uh, I know a lot of people have, but I don't, I can't say that. Um, you know, I, I, I can't pretend to know what my reaction would be. So I think it's very understandable um, that people are having this reaction. Um, what I don't think is understandable and what I think is actually uh, inexcusable is that there are a huge number of parents, of other parents, who are making decisions um, about vaccines based, again, as I said, on their instinct and not being honest with themselves about what that means for the people around them. Um, I think that's self-indulgent. I think it is uh, morally indefensible, um, especially when you're living in a situation um, in which there are children, in a community in which there are children who are, who are getting sick and dying. Um, there's one doctor, uh, fairly well-known doctor named Bob Sears, who is a proponent of, um, uh, he would say he's not a proponent, and he said that to me, but um, who is uh, accepting of um, selective vaccination or changing the vaccine schedule. And he has a book, and he says in his book, if you're worried that the MMR vaccine is damaging to children, don't get it and don't tell your neighbors. Because if you tell them and then they aren't vaccinated, then there's a chance of measles getting into the population. So think about that for a second. He's saying, if you think that this vaccine could permanently injure your children, don't do it, but don't tell the people living next to you that you think it could permanently injure their children also and let them get it so then they can protect you. Uh, <laughs> um, Bob Sears and I disagree about a lot of things. Um, uh, so, um, uh, but I think that um, one part of this discussion that I that I hope my book um, does spur uh, is a discussion about the responsibilities and the effects of the communities that are not the communities that we think of um, as the ones who are directly related to this. Uh, and that's my industry, the press, um, and my peers, young parents. Um, and uh, I think that in, in both of those, we need to have a different approach in the media about how we cover science and medicine. Um, and we need to have a different approach as uh, young privileged parents about how we consider um, our own role in society and how we make decisions about uh, health. Um, so there are a bunch of other points I wanted to get to, um, some of which I'll probably get to in the questions. So uh, thank you all for coming out on this incredibly cold night. And um, I, I would love to answer any questions that you have. Uh, the, the question is in reference to, in 1976, uh, there was a 19-year-old in an army barracks in New Jersey who died of, of flu, which is very unusual for a 19-year-old in very good health to die of flu. And um, there was concern at the time uh, uh, that that strain of flu was the strain of flu that had um, uh, that had killed hundreds of thousands of people at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Gerald Ford launched this um, mass immunization campaign uh, that didn't go well, um, uh, nor did his presidency. And, and when he lost, uh, I mean, literally, when he lost the election, then he dropped the, you know, he said, all right, let's forget this campaign. Um, it actually wasn't deaths. It was Guillain-Barre syndrome that there was a, there was a um, higher number than you would have expected. Um, it was still such a low number. It I, and. I have the number in here, but you know it's like the difference between uh, one in two million and four in two million, or something. So it's possible that that was the result of um, random statistical noise. Uh, I think one thing that 
we definitely saw in that instance was when the public health sector does a poor job of communicating um, public health measures to the public, especially mass public health measures, uh, there are long range consequences. Um, I, I don't think that, 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 that what happened in 1976 uh, sort of uh, it, it can, be, can be traced to what's going on today as much because I think one of the things that was different there was it was a, it was a population wide um, effort and not just a, a childhood effort. And still in the 70s, there were people who had personal experience with polio and um, who were more uh, aware of the risks of some of these diseases. There was a, a series of media reports in the early 80s, um, especially one uh, done by a woman who now is the consumer affairs reporter for the Today Show um, that uh, was very much in the um, very much in this sort of spirit of modern day vaccine scare coverage. Um, it was called uh, DPT, vaccine roulette. And um, it, the DPT is a diphtheria pertussis tetanus vaccine. And um, it would show, uh, you know, tragically um, uh, kids with really tragic developmental disorders and then say, did the pertussis vaccine cause this? These parents say yes. And then it would show the parents and then it would have some, you know, CDC official behind a desk saying, we don't have the information that we need to say that it does. And, um, you know, I would have come away from that thinking that, uh, thinking that it did also. And I think just one, one last point I want to make about that. I think another problem here is, um, there's the there's a communication problem on the part of the public health community to the public, uh, and there's also a sort of basic failure to understand on the public's part a, 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 a scientific truism, which is that um, you can't disprove a universal proposition. Um, so I have said in the past you can't disprove a negative, which I then get lots of angry emails about. Um, you know, which is which is true. You can you can prove that I am not a lion at this moment. You can't prove that I will never turn into a lion. Um, all you can say is that no human being has so far, and the chances of someone turning into a lion tomorrow are very slim. So, uh, what scientists would say when they're asked about vaccine safety is, as far as we know, this is safe. Which is you know, which means of the millions of of times when this has been given and, and we've looked at it, there has not been any connection shown between vaccines and autism. Um, you know, the world could always change. And I think that uh, scientists need to do a better job of communicating that. Um, and, and what I often hear when talking to people is, well, that's a very difficult concept to explain. I mean, I think most people just got it when I said that you couldn't prove that I wouldn't, I will never turn into a lion. So. Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure if it's it's a sort of assumed uh, uh, level of of intellect on the part of the public or, or what the problem is. But anyway, it's a typically circuitous answer to a straightforward question. Okay, the questions were um, during this period has there been an increase in autism, uh, and um, uh, if there has, tell me if I'm getting this right. What are the theories as to why that increase has come about? If there is a real increase. Right, okay, right, <laughs> right, because there are a lot of theories, right. Um, the answer to your first question is um, yes. Uh, there has been a real increase in the number of cases of autism, um, but it has not been the increase that is reported, which is now it's 1 in 110. It used to be 1 in 100,000 or a number that someone pulls out of the air. Um, <laughs> And that's because there are hugely different diagnostic criteria today than there were. Um, it, it, for years and years, autism was fairly narrowly defined as a very severe type of disorder. Uh, that has been expanded to include things like Asperger's syndrome, um, to include what is now referred to as uh, uh, PPD-NOS, which is um, uh, uh, pervasive, per pervasive PDD, I know, pervasive developmental disorders not otherwise specified. Um, uh, and uh, the, uh, when you read these, when you read the actual 
definitions of some of these. Um, I think probably I certainly recognized people who I grew up with that would have been diagnosed um, uh, with with you know a PDD NOS or um, they weren't at at the time. It's that's another discussion about the pathologization of behavior. But um, so that has definitely been responsible for some of the increase. There's also the fact that up until the 80s, the really the the only theory or the very, very, very prevailing theory about autism was that it was caused by emotionally frigid mothers, um, by refrigerator mothers who literally the children, the, their wombs were too cold for them to, um, uh, yes. Yes, so um, so understandably, if you had a child uh, that might be diagnosed with autism, you would not want that diagnosis. Um, you know, you would go for any other diagnosis. So there are a number of factors that led to uh, a rise. Um, however, even factoring in all of that, uh, if you take out everyone today who is diagnosed that would not have been diagnosed 20 or 30 years ago, there has been an actual rise in cases. Um, I think one of the many real tragedies of this is that we've now spent 10 years replicating studies about vaccines that could have and should have been focused on finding other environmental possible triggers. Um, and uh, there's a fairly widespread consensus that there is some environmental factor to this. So, uh, you know, there was a study that came out recently that showed that um, uh, children who were raised in close proximity to a freeway might have a higher, there might be a higher incidence of autism, which would, um, which would lend uh, credence to someone wanting to investigate more whether air pollution has some causal effect. Um, but really, we don't know a huge amount more than we did 20 years ago. We've come closer to identifying exactly where on the genome there might be a genetic component. Um, but I think it's one of the reasons that myths about autism are so uh, enduring, because it's really scary and we don't know a lot about it. Um, and, uh, you know, people want answers, understandably. Um, people want to be able to be told, if you do this, you will be okay, or this is why this happened. Um, there are, also aren't any very effective treatments. Uh, there are some type of behavioral treatments that, that show some, some uh, effectiveness, but, um, you know, in general, there's not a lot of really effective treatment. And I think all of that combines to create a situation where there's a lot of fear and anxiety. The question was, um, have I looked into actual problems with vaccines, right? Is that, yeah. Um, yes, and there have been actual problems with vaccines, without a doubt. And I think one of the, um, another one of the problems uh, or mistakes that people supporting vaccine use have made is presenting this as, um, as vaccines are 100% safe 100% of the time. Uh, nothing is 100% safe 100% of the time. Some tiny proportion of people um, will actually die as a result of wearing seatbelts because their chest will get crushed, as opposed to 99.8% you know, of the time, seatbelts saving people's lives. So, uh, you know, Every year, I'm sure someone dies in a bookstore because a sack of books falls on them. Um, there, there is, no, no, I'm being told no, that's not true. I think that's, I'm fairly certain actually that's only in chain bookstores, I think. That, um, but never independent bookstores, is that right? Yes. Uh, so um, yes, there are, uh, there is a risk associated with vaccination. Um, there is a vaccine court set up specifically to deal with, um, with situations in which uh, there is um, a concern that children have been harmed by vaccines. In many cases, um, the risk presented by the vaccine is uh, so many millions of times smaller than the risk of the disease if the child was not vaccinated. Um, 
that uh, when you're looking at the two, it, it's, it's, there's sort of no real comparison. Um, that being said, there have also been cases where there were huge mistakes made by drug companies. Um, right after the polio vaccine, with the soft polio vaccine was introduced, one of the four labs that was producing it um, uh, released contaminated batches um, and kids died and were paralyzed as a result of this, as a result of getting contaminated vaccine. Um, uh, this was called the Cutter incident, and I write about it in the book. Um, and I think in order for people to uh, feel like they're making an informed decision and, and feel comfortable about what they're deciding, they deserve to know what, you know, that, that no, vaccines have not always, um, there are cases where, um, where, where vaccines have injured children. Um, there are cases where, uh, you know, cars have malfunctioned and most people still choose to buy cars. Um, I think that there needs to be realistic and, and effective uh, risk communication. Um, because in part of these scares, vaccines are now the most studied childhood public health intervention. Um, so, uh, you know, out of everything that you are potentially going to do for your child, um, you know, I, I would I would say that uh, I, I, I would I would sooner vaccinate my child than I would let him listen or watch to one of those baby Mozart CDs or, or whatever. So, um, but yes, there are risks and there are situations where, where there have been mistakes made by drug companies. Um, the question was um, uh, specifically about why the, the media has this penchant for on the one hand, on the other hand, type of reporting about one-handed issues. Um, I think uh, first of all, I mean, I think you see it in some areas more than others. Um, science and health, you see it a lot. Uh, you don't see it as much in business. Um, if I was going to say, uh, I am planning on buying IBM tomorrow, um, it would be controversial. But you would not have a story in tomorrow's paper saying, Seth Mnookin says he's going to buy IBM. The chairman of IBM says that's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so uh, there are situations in which, um, or in sports, you know, if I said, um, uh, you know, uh, David Ortiz gained 800 pounds in the offseason, um, again, would be controversial and not true. So, uh, and if, if, if a newspaper or a TV station or a radio station went with that story, they would be humiliated hugely. I mean, they, people, you know, their, their, their customers would not trust them. Their peers would, would absolutely ridicule them. For some reason, that's not the case with science and medicine. Um, Oftentimes, I shouldn't say all the time, but oftentimes it's not the case with science and medicine. Uh, the other area it comes up a lot is politics, obviously. Um, I think that one of the reasons is because um, politics and science and medicine oftentimes make juicy stories. Uh, and um, it's, it's much more interesting to say, um, you know, uh, big scary company might be killing your children, then um, big scary company is actually not harming your children. Uh, you know, the first one is like, oh my God, that's, you know, that's incredible. I want to read about this. The second one is like, okay, now I'll go to the sports section. Um, so that's one issue. And I, and I think that's what you see all the time in politics. I think, you know, the, the birther movement was an example of how uh, uh, that came about. The, you know, if President Obama had not been born in this country, that would have been a big, huge scandal, and uh, and um, you know, again, much more interesting than saying um, our president born in the USA. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons. With science, I think also you get there. There is a there are not enough um, science reporters who have any degree of specialized training in the field. And I'm not talking about PhDs or, you know, I would not be assigned to go cover the ballet because I know nothing about ballet. Um, I know many instances in which there was a press release from uh, a drug company or the government or an advocacy group 
that then lands on a reporter's desk who doesn't cover that, um, and uh, and then is told, okay, write this up for tomorrow's paper. Um, and oftentimes there's a sort of minimal level of competency that's needed to be able to say, well, this actually isn't a story. Um, that initial Wakefield 1998 study of the 12 children, I think, a, and actually a very reasonable reaction on the part of a reporter would be, why would anyone draw a conclusion based on 12 children where the data is gotten from parents after the fact recollections? Um, you know, that's like going to the, the Kennedy family and saying, well, the percentage of men and women in the population is represented by the number of children that they have. I mean, it's absolutely, you know, 12 children is even if the data had not been uh, potentially fraudulent and tainted by um, selection bias and all these different things, it's ridiculous to draw a conclusion like that from, from 12 children from a case series. And reporters should have known that at the time. And editors should have said at the time, but we're absolutely not going to run this. You know, if you want to do a big story tomorrow, it can be irresponsible researcher tells, you know, tells public at press conference to do uh, well, no, I'm saying, I'm saying it's an institutional problem. I mean, I think that, I mean, yes, I think it's case by case ignorance. And the reason you get case by case ignorance is because there's an institutional allowance of that type of approach. Um, if, you know, it, if a newspaper was embarrassed by running that story the same way they were by saying I was buying IBM, um, then you would see it less and less. Um, the, the, one of the things that I've heard in response to that is, well, you know, we're losing staff. We can't have dedicated science reporters. Fine. Just have one person on your staff who understands science. I mean, again, you know, it's not understanding what a case series is or proving a, a universal negative proposition. It, this is not like... Um, it's not rocket science, uh, and, and having one editor on staff who you can sort of say, okay, well, is this a responsible way to cover this story would makes 20 good reporters. Um, so yeah, I think there needs to be, I think it's both a case by case basis and a need for an institutional change. Well, peer review, I mean, peer review, the question was, um, that no, that's that's a that that's a big problem with peer review in scientific journals is that it's anonymous. Um, it's anonymous to the public. However, if you're in a specialized field, it's not hard to figure out who is actually doing the reviewing. So, um, uh, and you know, so that means you're reviewing someone who's going to be reviewing your article down the line. Yeah, I think the peer review process in scientific articles is a huge problem. Um, I personally don't think it should be anonymous. Uh, but I also, um, I don't know enough about the uh, science and medical journal process to feel like I can speak that confidently on that. I do have a real problem with the anonymity of peer review. To the, to the first part of your question about whether newspapers are, uh, are, are, are competent and adequate to cover these issues. Um, uh, I, I'm going to flip that back a little bit, which um, is probably not a good idea to always disagree with my audience. But um, uh, I, you know, a, a couple of years ago, I was giving, I was talking about the general quality of the media. And I was in front of a crowd that was um, talking a lot about how things didn't get covered in an intelligent way. And, um, and so I asked them, how many people here subscribe to a daily newspaper? Um, how many people here subscribe to a uh, magazine, or two magazines, or three magazines? I know this is probably an atypical audience. But um, a very small proportion of people did. And my general feeling is, uh, if people are not happy with the quality of information they're getting, um, they should then make that clear by by paying for uh, and and you know subscribing to newspapers and and journals and making clear that they will pay for information that they do feel like is reliable. It's really expensive to do good journalism, um, and uh, it's really cheap to do bad journalism. Um, and I think that if we 
as a society want good quality journalism, we need to be willing to, to pay for it. Um, and uh, yeah, so, um, but I think obviously, I mean, I'm, I think that the quality of overall uh, coverage of science could be improved a lot in the country. There are a couple, could, could you guys hear that? Yes, okay. I, Right. I mean, I think there, well, that, I mean, that's one of, not to be glib, but that's one of the reasons I called it the panic virus, because I think once you scare people, it's very hard to unscare them. It's like, you know, the, um, the razor blade and the apple. Uh, no, there's never been a case, a documented case of a razor blade and an apple. Um, I don't know anyone who would allow their kid to have an apple. Uh, probably if, if parents, if all parents let their kids have apples on Halloween instead of candy, the net effect would be great and you wouldn't have anyone dying of razor blade, of, of swallowing razor blades. But um, so uh, I think that's one issue here and it's been exacerbated by the fact that the fear relating to vaccines, there hasn't been anything to offset it. So because we don't, in general, it's starting to change, but no, um, you know, children dying of whooping cough, or it's sort of like, well, what if this thing is true? And if I don't vaccinate my kid, what? Nothing, nothing happened. I've never, you know. Um, so I think that's one part of it. Uh, the other part is, and again, you saw this over the last couple of weeks where um, the, the latest round of stories was about outright fraud that Andrew Wakefield, the author, had purportedly committed. But you had on show after show after show and newspaper story after newspaper story, he had another chance to say, uh, no, I'm right, I'm being silenced because the drug companies don't want to admit what they've been doing to their parents, I mean to their children. Um, uh, this is a, a huge um, you know, conspiracy out to get me. And then that's contrasted with one or two quotes from someone else. And you know, it's, it's again, it's like, a million on one side and one on the other, but in a newspaper story or you get the one-on-one. -on -one. And any time you hear anyone say anything, um, there are a certain number of people who are gonna come away from that thinking it's true. One of the most fascinating studies I read in this was a study out of the University of Michigan that was done a couple of years ago where they, and it was during the H1N1 flu situation and they took students and they gave them 20 statements and they said 10 are true and 10 are false so what you know they weren't debating it they said 10 are true and 10 are false they told them these 10 minutes later there was uh the students had a very high proportion of correct identification for what was true and false um which went consistently down over the next several hours so one of the things that indicated is if you hear something, even if you hear it in the context of this is wrong, after a certain amount of time, what will remain with you is that you heard it. Um, so, uh, you know, again, if, if I said um, uh, there was, you know, there was a threat of a nuclear bomb in Harvard, in Harvard Yard, um, it's been disproven, uh, you know. Tomorrow, it's gonna be like, oh, wow, what if there is a nuclear bomb in Harvard Yard? Um, there isn't, as far as I know. Um, <laughs> the question was about the reaction to the book. Um, certainly not as positive as it has been here. Uh, um, most of the uh, emails I've gotten from people I don't know were, have been overwhelmingly negative, um, oftentimes violently so, uh, which I think is not hugely unusual about any issue. I mean, usually the people who seek you out and feel compelled to say something tend to have more negative reactions. But um, I have also received some reactions from people I don't know, primarily f from either uh, pediatricians or um, parents of children with developmental disorders who don't believe that they were caused by vaccines, who have been very grateful that someone from outside the community is talking about it. Um, yeah, so I've, I've gotten those two reactions, but I would say it's probably three to one in, uh, in favor of the, you know, um, uh, the Lord saith vengeance will be mine type emails. Um, 
I mean, you know, a certain number of which I actually need to forward on to someone so there's a record of them. Um, my wife wishes I would write about baseball more. Um, uh, my peers, um, it's, uh, I don't bring it up as much at dinner parties as one might think. I mean, I know a lot of people who haven't vaccinated and once I've said it's morally indefensible, um, it can be, it can make for an awkward, uh, awkward dessert. Um, uh, you know, I've tried to, I, I, I've, I, I've, a lot of the conversations I've had with friends of mine have still been along the lines of, um, well, there is something to that, right? Or, well, I'm going to space vaccines out. I just feel, I just, I think it's too much for a kid to deal with. And so I'm going to space it out over time, which for a while I was very patient with. And now I just feel like, you know, it's like spacing out your car's safety features. Like I'll wear the seat belt for the first six months and then I'll use the side airbags and then I'll use the front airbags. You know, it's the reason why you're vaccinated is because these diseases are either deadly or incredibly dangerous, and they're deadlier and incredibly dangerouser the younger you are. So, um, uh, yeah. So uh, the reactions have been varied, but thank you guys all. Sorry, Roger. But yeah, <laughs> thank you all.